I'm the lead technologies um, at VMware. Um, so, you know, I'm belongs to the specialist unit. And, um, you know, this about maybe about 50 to 60 of us in at VMware uh, here at, uh, you know, the APJ region, Asia Pacific region, which of course we cover uh, Indonesia as a market as well. Uh, there's about 50 of us and one of them. And um, I joined VMware about uh, seven years back, uh, you know, doing one thing to do uh, network virtualization. So before that, I was, I was doing, my background is uh, technical and I'm a network engineer and I work in uh, various companies as, uh, you know, both doing uh, design as well as deployment, right? So from uh, customers, you know, um, what we call as an end user environment. I also work as a, a system integrator, uh, you know, helping customers to design their networks uh, for a good 10 to 12 years. And before I decided to like, hey, you know, maybe I should take a look at uh, software-based networking, right? Which is very popular back in the 2012, 2013. And therefore I, I have I have never looked back, right? So I've been VMA for the last seven years. And uh, yeah, it's been a good journey so far. So, um, you know, in terms of certification, I, I'm a CCIE. I, I took a Cisco Certified Internet Network Expert. Uh, so that is a lab exam, right? Um, and then, you know, I didn't stop there. Then I came on to VMware. VMware have a design experts program. So I spent two, three years doing, going in front of a panel to defend my design. And uh, yeah, I'm very proud that I'm, uh, you know, VCX number 271. So this is a global recognition, uh, recognized certification for, you know, engineers who wants to develop themselves to be architect. Uh, so yeah. And then, from there, I also help out a lot with the community, such as a discount event. So, you know, I've been awarded the V expert. Um, yeah, but I didn't stop there. So over the last three to four years, I've been uh, doing a lot on modern applications. So that's where, you know, you can see certification like uh, certified Kubernetes uh, security specialist, CKA uh, certified Kubernetes administrator. And right now I'm actually doing, uh, trying to learn more about service mesh. Um, and I'm trying to go for my Istio certification, right? So, um, yeah, I mean, if you want to, you like to know more about, you know, uh, my career and you, you just want to talk to, you know, happy to talk to you, right? Um, I'm sure, you know, the networking um, industry really needs lots of uh, folks like you, right? So, um, you know, do consider, and, and I, I hope that by, giving you this lecture, right? It, it opened kind of your door to uh, lots more opportunities to look out for. And yeah, I hope this interests you. And there's always innovations in the, in the networking field. And uh, yeah, I have never stopped learning things. So I hope that uh, this inspire you. Okay, so let's uh, jump straight in um, into the presentation. Yeah. So before I forget, wow, well, that's like good. Um, if you all don't mind, can I just take a screenshot? Because there's a lot of, uh, you know, people over here. Um, yeah. So it's for my, for my um, memory purposes. Okay. So yeah, let's go. So I, I like to give you a brief introduction, right, on um, VMware and networking and security. So um, let me explain a little bit why, why do I need to do this? Because if you, if you try to Google uh, about VMware, VMware is actually well known for our, our virtualization technology, right? We start out with server virtualization. Um, we are not well known for our networking and security uh, technologies, okay? Uh, and that actually changed back in 2012, okay? So we, you know, just to give you a very high level what is virtualization. So virtualization, like, you know, you have a physical server and then what you actually do is you put some hypervisor in it and you can then turn that physical machine into 
you know, runs your virtual machines. You can run, you know, 50, hundreds of them virtual machines on a single host. And uh, basically that helps in driving down the cost. It also increases the optimization uh, on the utilization of the physical servers. Okay, of course, there's lots, lots of other benefits over there, like high availability, you know, uh, a lot of other use cases that are being generated out just from virtualization. And of course, if you think about cloud, virtualization actually comes first, you know, before we can even, even have cloud, right? Because it's, um, we allow the sharing of uh, servers or computers uh, by creating many instances of the machines on that physical machine. So um, network virtualization is like an extension of that. So in uh, 2012, uh, we already started on the journey, what we call as a software-defined data center journey. So we have what we call uh, the data software-defined data center. So VMware went into develop software-defined storage. Right? So what we do with the server, we do it with um, for storage. And the last piece of the puzzle is actually the network piece. So we did the virtualization of the network piece. Okay. So like what I said, um, you know, VMware was actually not very well known for networking and security back in 2012, right? But, you know, we already started doing things on uh, networking and security. We have this thing called the virtualization, uh, sorry, the virtual switch. And uh, we have a lot of customers already use our virtual distributed switches, right? So we actually got serious in uh, in network virtualization in 2012, we acquired this company called NICERA. It's one of the biggest acquisition of a software-defined networking then. Then of course, then, you know, we actually, after the acquisition, we actually integrate with the vSphere distributed switch, the, all the networking and security uh, technologies that we have, and we launched this product called the NSX for vSphere, mainly targeted for VMware customers. However, in 2016, um, we actually uh, saw cloud and containers coming. So, you know, our so-called 1.0, you know, NSX for vSphere couldn't uh, address those container and cloud technologies, right? And therefore, we went to revamp the whole um, solution. And what we call today is the NSXT. So since then, we have been enhancing our solution by, with, with, the, with the use of acquisition to acquire more technologies and integrate to the platform. And also, you know, um, organically, organically um, you know, at VMware, we enhance the solution as well. So just in a nutshell itself, right, these are all the, you know, monitoring solution that we add into the portfolio. Carbon Black is like um, endpoint security, Right, we have SD WAN solution as well. We also make a software defined base load balancing company called RV Networks. Okay, and last line is really you know the uh you know the NDR network detection and response company. So once we acquire this, we actually make our NSXT platform a full fledged uh networking and security platform. And if you look right, this is like we are 2022 now. That's 10 over years of innovations. Um, you know, at VMware on the networking and security journey. Okay, so I think we're going to we're going to make a we make a big impact in the market. Okay, by launching this NSXT solution. So, you know, hopefully by the end of this session today, you get to know a little bit more about NSXT, and uh, yeah, it's one of the leading you know SDN platform on the market itself. So just to give you some statistics over here, we are the number one uh, SDN software. We have quite a big market share, 65% of the market share. 91 of the Fortune US, uh, Fortune 100 US company actually uses this software, right? They are in production. Uh, as we speaking, there are networks being routed, switched, switched with the NSXT software, okay? It's not something that you, you play around in the lab itself. Um, you know, of course, we 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 are very proud. Okay, so this is of course doing you know the society uh good, right? Like reduce the carbon footprint, you know, by using less hardware, and uh, of course, we really have 
uh, we already started this load balancing journey, replacing load balancing journey, replacing hardware load balancer uh, journey uh, for a long time. But we got serious when uh, you know we acquired RV Networks, and we're really proud. Like so far, we have replaced twelve thousand uh, hardware based load balancer. Okay, so we also we also have one of the fastest uh, internal firewall, twenty terabits per second. Right, so you know, the, the opportunities or the potential of software-defined networking is really endless, right? If you can see from these statistics over here. Okay, so I've been talking about this NSX and really like, you know, so what is really NSX? And I really like this uh, animated slides over here because it gives you a very good visual and like, you know, what NSX is all about, okay? Just give me a minute. Just this. Okay, so you have the physical network over here. Then you have the application layer. So what NSX is trying to do is not to replace your physical network. So when I started like talking about NSX with a lot of customers, a lot of people start thinking like, "Hey, is this software is going to replace my physical network?" No, your physical network is still there. It's just that what we are trying to do over here is those advanced features that your network switches or routers is trying to do, we're trying to virtualize it, trying to abstract it, put it into software so that you can actually use it over any kind of switches that you have, right? So that gave you the capabilities of like hardware agnostic, uh, capability of hardware agnostic. You can use like a Cisco, you can use a Juniper on a physical network. It doesn't really matter because those feature set that you actually want to use, like for example, switching, like doing overlay, routing, firewalling, IDS, IPS, advanced threat prevention, load balancing, web application firewall, your monitoring or service mesh is being abstracted from the hardware layer. Okay. So with that, what we are able to provide you is this consistent you know, set of technologies, okay? Full layer two to layer seven stack. Hopefully, but you, you understand what I'm talking about. Like, you know, if you understand the OSI layer, the layer two to layer seven stack, right? The full networking capabilities for, you know, whether you want to do it for the policy layer that you want to, you know, set your configuration and, you know, your intent, and then the platform will actually realize it for you or whether it's for visibility or analytics, okay? So that's what we're trying to do over here. Okay, so that's very, very high level, 50,000 feet, right? You know, what we are trying to do here with NSX platform. And now let me go and talk about uh, the use cases, right? What are the real life use cases? What are customers, what are our, our customers are using it for? And how does the architecture actually looks like? So when we talk about um, the portfolio itself, we have actually multiple solutions. As I said, right over the last ten years, we have you know extend from you know just one product NSX data center to multiple solutions over here. So now we call this portfolio of products or solutions called the virtual cloud network. So basically, what virtual cloud network is is a portfolio of products like what I mentioned, built on the foundation, the concept of any infrastructure, any cloud, any application, any platform, right? So we want to create this platform for you so that you can run any application on any cloud itself, right? Whether it's on a private cloud infrastructure, public cloud infrastructure, your data center, or even the edge, okay? So um, as I say, the capabilities that we want to provide or the solution we want to provide is security, integration, automation, and having this elastic fabric that is able to scale, scale in and scale out according to your needs. So the four key use cases um, for the NSX data center. Okay, so today we're just going to focus a little bit on the NSX T data center. Okay, so the four key use cases will be security. Security is one of them to help to address the lateral threats in your data center itself. So we are, yeah, the, using NSX T, we are able to provide you know, control so that you can actually control your east-west traffic, right? Preventing, you know, attackers from coming in to move laterally into your data centers. Second one is multi-cloud networking, right? We're talking about private cloud or it could be 
uh, public private cloud with public cloud or talking about multiple private cloud over here or multiple data centers itself, helping you to do, for example, like disaster recovery, right? So that's uh, the, the second use case. Third use case is on automation, okay? So, you know, imagine you have a lot of different uh, products, like, for example, like Cisco, like Juniper, and, you know, all your load balancer, like F5 and all this. And you try to do automation, it's actually very hard because every vendor itself will have their own interface and their way of doing automation. So what NSX is trying to provide over here, it's, you know, this, you really saw the capabilities that we have. We have layer two to layer seven. So what we can able to do is provide you with this single API so that you can actually establish the, the API call. It actually helps you to automate the full stack over here from switching routing to net services, load balancer, firewall services, okay? So that's what we meant by automation. Uh, a lot of customers also call us like self-service IT use case where the IT organization become more like a service provider. So what they do is they use make use of NSXT together with the cloud management platform. They will offer it as a private cloud services, right? Just like how you consume. I, I understand you all went through some uh, GCP um, training as well. So very similar like what you experience in the GCP, right? the public cloud. We can offer that experience uh, in your private data center as well. As well. The last use case is on cloud native applications. So this is where, you know, we talk about microservices with the modern apps, where we can actually provide same kind of network and security for virtual machine. But now we can actually extend it to support containers as well. Okay. So with that, you get this single platform where you can actually support all different kinds of workloads, whether is it virtual machines, whether is it bare metal servers, containers, or even in the cloud, okay? So what are some of the features that, you know, uh, that we support? And you might, you might find it um, interesting over here because there's a lot of things that we didn't change, right? We didn't, we didn't change the construct. We didn't, we didn't reinvent the wheel, okay? So I'll, I'll talk about it later on. So on the platform side, we support um, multi-hypervisor, okay? Um, you know, we support our VMware hypervisor, which is EXXI. We also support KVM, okay? We have a cloud support as well. We support multiple site, uh, what we call the federation technologies, okay? Uh, in networking, I, I, I think this is what I mean by, you find this very familiar. Of course, we need to support things like switching, you know, uh, bridging and all this kind of thing that you probably have learned in your course. Now, of course, we also support the routing protocols like BGP and OSPF because your virtual world actually needs to talk to the physical world. Therefore, we actually need to support the routing protocols that your physical world is, is running on, which is BGP and OSPF. Um, yeah, so for security services, we have like, Gateway firewall basically is a VM based firewall. We also have distributed firewall where it's basically firewall that you actually run in the hypervisor itself. We are able to do uh, intrusion detection prevention system, IDS. We are able to provide malware preventions, right? We get a malware, we can actually scan. So, and then, you know, of course, right now you heard a lot about ransomware itself. So, basically, what we have is a sandbox. We can actually take that ransomware and actually scan it and break it up and tell you that, hey, is this malicious or is this okay to run in your environment? Okay. And then, of course, we have a lot of other innovations, uh, features over here like NSX intelligence, where we're able to look at your traffic flow and give you recommendation on the firewall rules itself. Okay. Now, of course, we support automation, right? All the standard RESTful, JSON, API support, okay? Uh, takes care of the operations as well. I'm gonna show you in the UI when the demo later on, so you get to see what I'm talking about here, right? Of course, all these are still very important, like how you back up and restore your system, how you upgrade your platform, right? So you want to have, um, you know, your latest and greatest features, you actually need to upgrade the platform. And upgrading is, you know, when you talk about SDN, it can be uh, quite a, a big task to upgrade because there's multiple components over here. 
and therefore we need some uh, technologies to help us to manage the life cycle of uh, the upgrade. Then last but not least, we have troubleshooting, right? So just like you know, you have tools to do troubleshooting like trace route and all this kind of thing. In the virtual world, we also needed to have all these tools as well. So we have pop mirroring where you can actually mirror the traffic into Wireshark and you look at the packet itself. We have trace flow, very similar like trace route, but we can actually simulate flows in the SDN layer so that you, you do not need to log into the operating system itself, but you can actually see how is the packet flow is going to like. So they can actually see you know, every hop where it's actually hops to. And uh, you know, if there's any firewall in the in the in the chain, they actually is trying to block the traffic over here. Okay. And um, yep, that's very interesting. You you can only find this in a in a in a software defined networking world. Um yeah. So from the architecture perspective, okay, I think from if you look at the market itself, you know, when you talk about software defined networking, definitely it has moved from uh, the traditional model where everything is running in a single unit where you have the management plane, control plane, as well as the data plane, a single unit, and then you have multiple of this. Uh, in a software defined networking world, we actually break that up. Okay, we break up the you know the control plane, the management plane, and data plane. And right now the data plane is of course distributed into different kinds of endpoints. So in terms of the management, right, we have this management clusters which call the uh, NSXT management clusters is basically a comprises of three virtual machines. And then we actually build a cluster and then it has the UI component so that you, the user can actually use the NSXT management. Okay, we also have the, the CLI. Of course, you can also use API to interact with the management cluster, right? So a lot of people call it the northbound APIs and all this, right? So this is, this is, the, uh, this is what we're talking about over here. Of course, we have integration with other components as well, such as um, NSX container plugins in the container environment. We have vCenter where, you know, uh, this is the management component of your hypervisors where you see all your workloads over there. So that's vCenter server. That's the integration as well. So when you, in, when you integrate with the vCenter, you get to see all the workloads that's running in your environment. I will probably show you in the, in the demo later on. Then we have the data plane. So data plane could be comprises of virtual machines and containers, okay? And it can be, uh, it exists in various form factors itself, right? So it, it can, we, we support like EXXI host, which is the VMware hypervisor. We also have the KVM, uh, um, which is, uh, you know, a popular one will be supported by Red Hat, okay? We can also install NSX into the bare metal server itself. Right, so this is a form of agent where you can actually push software into the bare metal server and we can actually manage the bare metal server. All the stateful or all the services, like for example, like NAT, load balancer and all this, these are running in the NSX H, right? So this is a virtual machine and we run all our services inside there. We also support the extension to public cloud. So this is where you have like, for example, AWS EC2 uh, instances where we can actually uh, whether it runs Linux or Windows, we have a way to actually um, run some software in it and we can actually manage uh, those workloads from NSXD Manager as well, right? We actually does that with the NSX Cloud Gateway, which is basically that helps you to build the integration uh, from your NSXD Manager to the cloud instance, right? So this is uh, giving you more details over here. This is the management clusters. Yeah, so it basically supports RESTful API. You can actually use, um, you know, a popular one. If you just want to test out, it would be Postman. You can use a Postman. You can connect to your NSX manager. You can actually do some API calls over there, right? Then you can actually use the API to configure whatever you want. So we build our platform from, a, from an API first. Right, so we build the APIs, and then after that, we build the UI to use the API itself. Right, so almost anything that you're trying to do on the NSXT manager can be used uh, with the use of a RESTful API call. Right, because this is very important, right? Because end of the day, what we're trying to do here is we're going to make automation as the first priority. Okay, so the the management clusters also runs the control plane. Okay, so if you're familiar with uh, SDN controllers, right? 
uh, basically when you're trying to build an overlay over there, you actually need to know all the endpoints, IP address, as well as the MAC address, okay? So typically this is being stored, like for example, in a unit, in the switch itself, this is stored inside the switch, but in the distributed world, in the software defined world, your, your data plane is actually, you know, all your hypervisors and all this. So those records, those MAC address and IP tables and your tab entries, all these are being stored in the controller. The controller have a record, which is basically like a database of all these uh, records. So whenever someone needs to communicate with from one machine to the other machine, the, the, the NSXT will actually need to do a lookup from the table and let you know where is the endpoint to send to, okay? So later on, I have some, I have some uh, packet flow so that you can actually understand this, uh, this better. Okay, so some, some things to note over here, um, there's multiple roles that an NSX manager can do, okay, such as uh, the policy management roles and uh, controller roles. Okay, don't worry about that. These are just the functionality of the control plane. Um, and yeah, I want to mention this, you know, why do we have to run three uh, instances, right? This is for high availability and scalability purposes, right? So that, um, you know, when one of the manager actually goes down, you know, the system doesn't just break down, right? The, the other managers can actually take over the role and, you know, the operations can continue working. Okay, so been talking a bit, um, you know, why not? Just take a look at uh, how does the UI actually looks like, okay? So, um, oh yeah. So what I'm actually using here, uh, I forgot to mention this, um, you know, you know, I, I like you to maybe also like, um, you know, uh, listen, listen, uh, look look at this first, right? Because you will be doing this in your lab session. There's actually six lab sessions that I have arranged with Rafi. And, uh, you know, because we each lab, we can only take about 40 people. So uh, that's why we have six sessions. And what I'm doing over here is just give you a, a stiblet, uh, um, you know, a short demo on what you could expect on the lab itself, okay? And... Uh, so right now I'm logging into the, to the lab. Don't worry, we'll give you all the instructions on how to actually access this. You can even access this after the lab session as well, right? This is always available. Our customers actually uses this, so uh, there's no difference. This is not a demo software or anything like this. This is the real software. It's just that it's running in the lab environment. That's all, okay? So, um, okay, so I, I'm going to show you what's a V a V center, right? So this is NSX V sphere. So basically, this is our management product to manage uh, our workloads over here. Okay. So once you log into V center, you get to see all the hypervisors itself. I say, okay. You haven't shared your screen about the. Oh. Yeah. I didn't share my screen. I'm oh, so sorry. Are you seeing now? Okay. So I'm just trying to say, this is the V center. So once you log into the V center, you get to see all your workloads, okay? So this is all your all the workloads that I have. This is the hypervisor that I'm talking about over here, the XXI, right? So you install this software on the hypervisor itself, right? Obviously this is a virtual one, right? A virtual server. So you only have 16 gig of RAM and a 50 gig of uh, storage and it, gigahertz of, uh, which is not very high, right? This is just a virtual environment. But as I said, uh, although this is a virtual platform, um, a nested environment, but the software that you see over here is the exact software that we actually use it for our customers, okay? And then this is the H nodes, okay? Logging into the NSXT, which is our, what we are uh, focusing on, right? NSXT platform, okay? Logging to the, I'm using the UI right now. So we are logging to the UI. Okay. So you can see once you log in, you get the dashboard of looking at all the different networking and security um, objects that you have, what are the inventories, right? 
So you also get to see the networking tab. Okay, so gateways are like routers. And then we have segments, which is switches. We can also set up VPN, right? For example, if you want to connect your on-prem environment to public cloud, you can actually do that, okay? Um, we have load balancer uh, services as well, okay? And then this is security. Security, we have distributed firewall, you know, our gateway firewall, which is a VM-based firewall, okay? And then of course, our advanced threat prevention capabilities, the security capabilities. Right, and inventory. So you know we have integrated this platform in our V Center. Okay, so with here you can now see all your workloads over here. Right, so with this now you can actually create grouping like security grouping. Right, you create group. Okay, you can set your members. You can actually pull out. Uh, you know you can use virtual machines, uh, names and all this. Okay, so this this is a uh. A big change, okay. Once you have this integration, because for example, like if you are thinking about firewall, normally people actually use this IP address to write firewall rules. But right now, with the integration with vCenter and this security grouping concept and a pool concept, we no longer are limiting ourselves in writing policy based on IP address, right? So this is a big shift in the way on how you think about, um, you know, networking, right? Because you know when you talk about networking, you know IP address is your is the common lingo between like different people, right? If you talk to a server server admin, they will tell you, hey, you know, give me some IP address that I need to configure for my servers. Um, you know, but this changes. You know, with software defined networking, that kind of conversation actually changes. Now you are talking about, hey, can I have a pool of address? You know, I don't really need to assign IP address to you. You just make sure that they are on this network. And NSXT will take care of uh, assigning you IP address, for example, right? And if you talk about containers, it's, uh, <laughs> this is, you can't assign IP address anymore, right? You, you just really have to rely on concept, something like DHCP to help you to assign your IP address, okay? Of course, this is the day two operations tools, okay? And uh, of course, this is the system aspects and all this kind of thing, all right? So just want to give you a quick overview on uh, you know you know what what is the software that I'm talking about over here right so I hope that you know this will break uh the the monotonous just slides and then you know hopefully this this wakes you up a bit uh, so that you know uh, you get to see some of the the software in action okay uh okay let's go back into the slides slides okay uh human Okay, so so again, um, you know, this is how you log into the NSXT manager. You just put in the IP address or FQDN, then your username and password you're able to log in. Uh, so this is the lab that I use. It's called NSXT Network Fundamentals. So I really enrolled in the lab. So don't worry about this. Um, yeah, just focus on the materials and learn as much as possible you can today. And, and you know, you can actually practice it in your uh, lab session uh, in the following weeks. Okay. So this is the guide. Um, uh, this is a PDF document. This will help you to do uh, do your lab session. So uh, the lab assistants will distribute this out for you. So don't worry about that. Okay, so quickly, let's jump into switching. I think um, this, this will give you a start into one of the you know, most fundamental capabilities in NSXT. So when we talk about switching, right? Let's let's talk about the use case first. Okay. So if you if you look on your right over here, uh, this is like your traditional data center where you have your this is your uh, switching fabric. So this is still based on you know your layer two switching and then your layer three routing is just at a core. Okay. So these are your servers, and you have different kind of workloads over here. They bring your blue workloads, purple workloads, and green workloads. Okay. So in your traditional data center, you know. Why, why do you actually need to use like, for example, like VLANs or switching, okay? So of course you want to separate, you want to segment your applications. It could be for different environments, uh, you know, production, um, you know, testing environment and all this. So that for, therefore you actually um, set up different tenants or different VLANs. However, uh, you know, 
to use vSphere vMotion, right? Like, you know, vMotion is the capability in VMware uh, vSphere where you allow to live migrate your workload. Like, for example, you know, you can actually move this blue workload from this hypervisor to the other hypervisor without any downtime. However, on the network side, what it requires you is to have this layer two span because if you do not have this layer two span, when you move this workload to the other hypervisor, it might just break the network connectivity and the workloads will just, the traffic to the, to the workload will just be back home. However, that also create a big problem if you start to span your layer two everywhere in your data center, that causes a network sprawl. You know, if you're familiar with a broadcast storm, right? Big layer two network are uh, prone to broadcast storm, right? And that will can bring your whole network down, okay? And the other thing is also like switches have very limited uh, MAC address entry. So if you have a lot of, v especially in a virtualized environment, if you have a lot of VMs, you could actually run out of uh, MAC address table entries, right? So some switches, right, they have like 5,000 MAC entries, right? So you could easily run out of MAC address uh, memory. So with the use of NSXT, uh, what we are able to do is, right, so we are able to still let you to have multi-tenancy across your data center, allow you to use this, spend this layer tool everywhere in your data center, but without all these, you know, broadcast storm issues, okay? How we avoid all these broadcast storm issues is we make sure that your network fabric is configured using a spy and leave layer three architecture so that you, your layer three, your layer two domain is kept to very small, so that if you have any broadcast storm, it only a, a portion of your network only be affected, not the whole entire network. Okay, so we actually use this by using the overlay technologies. So you you have heard like VXLAN, Geneve. This is what we are talking about over here. So with the overlay technologies, what we allow you to do is you can create segments that span physical holes and network switches. Okay, so how how to create these logical switches so first of all you need to make sure that um, you know your management clusters are created okay um, you know that's like what i have shown you right the management clusters created and then the transport nodes need to be prepared means basically you need to install the software onto the hypervisor itself so don't worry about this um you know i i, I rearrange the topic so that this you can actually see how this is being done without worrying too much about uh, what's in the hood, what's under, what's underneath, uh, so so you can appreciate the use case better. Okay, so what are some of the components or several concepts we need to cover over here? We have the web segment, so this is the, you know, very similar like VLAN. Okay, you can create a VLAN. Okay, this is treat this is like a physical switch, but in this case, this is not a physical switch, but running in your hypervisor itself. Okay. And then we have what we call a segment ports. Basically, these are like switch ports, okay, that you can actually connect to the virtual machines itself. Okay, we have we also have containerized application. You can also use that to connect to your physical ports. And we also have uh you connect to the router, just like you know your switch, you can connect your router. We we actually connect our switches to a tier zero or tier one gateways as well. Okay, so this is what we're referring to, right? So things to take note is segments. And uh, yeah, and the, 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 where does the actually segment runs is actually runs in the transport node itself. So what is a segment? Again, this is just an official um, you know, explanation. Uh, it's a layer two broadcast domain across transport nodes, right? The VM you can attach to the, to the segment. Then if they, con if, they are on, if they are on the same segment, basically they can actually communicate with each other. Just like VLAN, um, you know, we have uh, VLAN IDs, right? So in segments itself, we also have the, you know, uh, what we call the virtual network identifier, VNI. So uh, I want to say it's resident of VNI. Okay, so I'm sure that you all have, will be very good at this. Maybe a question for you. You know, how many bits are there on a, on a VLAN ID? Anyone? How many bits? Remember the Ethernet? I think the jerk from that student will know because we have already passed this. How many bits are there? 
do a search. Yeah, you on Google. Uh, thirty-two, okay. thirty-two, sir. Hmm? How many bits? Not a, not the IP, not the IP, um, not a MAC address. I'm talking about the VLAN ID. Okay, how many how many VLANs can you have in your net in a network, a typical network, like a switch? Anyone? Let me see the chat. 12 bits, yes, 12 bits. And with 12 bits, you could do 4,096 VLAN IDs, okay? Um, VXLAN, it's 24 bits, okay? And it can give you 16 million networks, okay? So if you if you talk about in the service provider itself, um, you know it, they could reach the four zero nine six limits, okay, and therefore they actually needs to use something like uh, overlay or VXLAN or journey to overcome this four zero nine six limit, right? So that will give them like sixteen million networks, which is probably a big number, and uh, they could probably uh, use it for very long, okay. Good, so. So basically, um, segments created on holes where you can actually have the transport zones. Okay, so basically, this is about transport zone. Right, transport zone is where you say, okay, how far, how many holes does my this segment actually needs to be in? Okay, um, so we're gonna talk about the transport zone later on. Okay, don't worry about that. So the segment can also be an overlay base which is like what we talked about before, right? Uh, the 60 million types of network, or it can also be like a, phys sorry, a physical network, like a 4,096 kind of VLAN based kind of network. Okay, so you can choose what kind, you, what kind of segment you want. Um, and of course, you can coexist as well. You can, you can have both, right? VLAN based, based net segments and overlay based segments as well. Uh, of course, you use the UI API to do that. Um, and you can have different kinds of workloads, such as VMs, containers, all connected to the same type of segment ports. Okay, so, so you might be wondering, okay, I can connect to a virtual switch in, a, in, in my transport node itself, but how do they actually communicate across your hypervisor, right? Because before that, it actually need, I mean, your workloads actually, if you use a VLAN base, it actually uses the physical switch to switch. But in a in a overlay type of scenario, uh, we actually need to use encapsulation and decapsulation to achieve that. Okay, so what you actually do is we take um, you know this is a tunnel endpoint. This is the IP address that you configure over here. Right, if you are familiar with like GRE, this is very similar like uh, GRE like generic uh, encapsulation. So what it does is this VM one will send out the frame. Okay, pass it to the hypervisor itself do the encapsulation, send it over to the other transport node. The other node will remove the encapsulation, decapsulation, and then send the frame back to VM2 itself. And therefore, that's how VM1 and VM2 will communicate. So again, who holds the record of tunnel endpoint, the MAC address, and all this kind of thing is the controller. Right? So before the, before the tunnel endpoint can reach to the other endpoint, the transport node actually needs to look up on the controller, where is this work roadmap address? Right, which tunnel endpoint do I need to reach to? So once you look up from the controller, then you will know. Okay, now I can actually send it to this um, tunnel endpoint to reach the VM two. Okay, yeah. So this is basically uh, more information, right? So the source encapsulate in the Geneve header. Okay, so Geneve is the standard that we actually use in NSXT itself. Okay, it's, uh, it's open. You can actually go and read about journey header. Journey header actually uh, give us more room to uh, enhance the protocol. Okay, there's so for example, you can use it to do um, the, some day two operations, right? How we inject some simulated packets inside there, right? So that give us a capability. We, we, we contribute, VMI contribute a lot on the journey uh, protocol. So, it's uh is using UDP packet to transmit over the network and it trans and it uses port six zero eight one okay and of course the like one I mentioned in the previous slide this one will just decapsulate the chain fader and send the frame to the destination VM 
Okay, so it runs on UDP. Um, Journey runs on UDP, adds an 8 byte UDP header. Okay, uses a 24 bit VNI, right? This is why I mentioned over here. And yeah, it supports in TCP dump and Wireshark. So if you if you take uh, your Wireshark, you hook up onto your physical network and you try to capture the packets that is being transferred, uh, the journey packets is being transferred on your physical network, you can actually see uh, those uh, headers, these journey headers over here, right? Okay, so um, basically this is how, you know, um, just two VMs, the back address, right? Uh, showing you how the, the actual the more deep dive packet flow. So step one is sent over here, right? And then to the tab, right? So there's a there's a VM colo interface on the ESXi, which holds this IP address, right? 172.20.11.51. So it takes this frame, right? Add in the journey header, put in the IP address on the UDP packet, and then send it over to the other side. Then the other side will take out the journey header. That be the layer two frame, and then pass it back to the virtual machine. Okay. So this is how you actually communicate. So let me actually show you some demo, right? Again, you know. Um, yeah, I yeah. So imagine you never see this. Um, I I because this is a fully set up lab, okay, and um, yeah, actually maybe it's okay. No problem. So, so I'm, I'm going to create a logical switches, right? You can see that it's very simple. And, 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 and maybe what I'd like you to think about is, you know, compare this with what you experience on the physical, you know, when you want, when you're trying to create a VLAN and then connect some servers to it, right? Okay. So to compare it. So for example, I would say, okay, um, uh, I don't know. Let's see. Let's see any name? Okay, let's let's call it VBG. I don't know. I have no idea what's VBG. Okay. Okay, connect to some gateway, and I select the transport zone. Okay, so we kind of say that like, there's two types of transport zone. I connect to the overlay one. Okay, and that's it. I can save it. This is how I create a oh, what says. Oh, okay, I need to give you the IP address. Um, okay, maybe I can't do this because I'm gonna use, I'm gonna use back the same one. Okay, so I really need to do something first. Give a minute. Because I, I, I'm actually trying to do this, create the same web logical switch, but this is already exist. So I need to change the workloads first. So I'm gonna use these two web virtual machines. Okay, they are configured. On the same segment 172.16.11 and this is on uh, 10.12 okay i'm going to just change the, the network into some uh generic one first before i connect to a switch okay so i connect to this uh vm switch okay. Okay, so now I have, now I can actually go and delete this away. Okay. Just wait a while. Thing. Web one VM, there's still one VM so is connected to it. Let me see which is the VM. <clears throat> No more really. Okay, good. Okay, so I've deleted it. So this is this is how you actually create a, a segment, right? So uh, VS, okay, let's create a web segment. Okay. Web logical switch connected to the gateway, select the transport zone. Okay, you can actually put the IP address. This is like the SVI, the, the gateway of your 
your uh, machine that you had configured, right? So if they need to route, they will actually use this. So I should just put in the subnet. Okay, you can actually save it. So once you create the, the logical switch, okay. Okay, this is, uh, this is, this is done. Okay, now what I'm going to do is once I created this web LS, okay, you can actually see this network is being created over here. Okay, so this is auto discovered by the vCenter. Uh, okay, you can actually create a switch. And now this tool is actually running on the same segment. I'm going to put one on the, uh, I'm going to put one, I'm going to go like log in to the, to the, to the machine itself. Okay. I'm just going to put this machine into this network so that I can show you that it's on a different network and it's, if it's trying to ping to the, the other IP address, it wouldn't work, okay? So right now, yeah, I'm going to put to this new logical switch that I've created, web LS, okay? And to show you that this is the actual IP address, I also console into this machine. Okay, I'm showing you IP address, right? 172.16.10.12. So this machine is 172.16.10.11. So I'm going to ping the other machine. You can see that it doesn't ping, okay? Because it's not on the same logical switch. So right now I'm going to go into vCenter. Now I'm going to change this network. I'm going to change it to a web logical switch. Okay. Now you can see that the ping comes up, right? Is uh, the two VMs able to communicate with each other, right? So basically these two net, um, machine are on the same network, right? The other way to look at it is like you click on this, you can actually see these two VMs are on the same, on this network itself. Right. So this is like, for example, if your server administrator is managing all these virtual machines, they are able to see these as well. So now you see, right, it's if you compare this with your physical world, right? I'm just doing a few clicks over here and you know I'm able to hook up networks for your virtual machine. Right? It's much more simpler than what you actually have to do. I, I didn't even have to lock into a physical switch to do any of all this. Okay. Um, so which means that now I have I have elevated all the networking functions into into a virtual stack, right? And what what the as, as as I mentioned, the physical network is still important, okay. But we only rely to do what is best, which is basically switch or route packets, correct? Okay? And then keep it as simple as possible, so that you know, I mean, who doesn't know how to troubleshoot a physical network, right? Almost everybody, you know know how to troubleshoot the network. And we should keep it that way, right? The rest of the thing, uh, we, should, we should leave it up to the stack, right? So let's say, for example, if your Cisco switch fail, right? You, you, are, you only have maybe a Juniper switch. You can just take it and replace it and connect to your layer three network. And all this function, all this layer switching and routing will still work across all these physical hardware, okay? Yeah, so... Um, Okay, just last one more. I know we have, I've talked about one, it's about one hour now and I, I, I did um, say that we will have a break, but um, I still have a little bit more before we, we go for a break. Okay, hopefully you are fine with that. I'm going to touch on this. This is a very short module. This is going to talk about transport zone. And then after that, you can go for your break. So data center, and as I mentioned, there's various endpoints. Okay, so what it does is provide this forwarding and encapsulation, decapsulation of packets based on the tables that's managed by the NSX manager control plane. Uh, it's a distributed forwarding model. Okay, it performs logical switching, distributed centralized routing, and firewall filtering. Okay, so that's what the data plane is for. So I have talked about like the tunnel endpoints that forms the tunnel. They was wondering, hey, do I actually need to configure IP address for the tunnel endpoint? Yeah, you do need the IP address, but you don't really need to configure it because what we, as I said, as I mentioned, a lot of things are actually being automated. Uh, what you do is you create a network pool. Okay, so once you create this pool, you assign it to the transport node. The transport node will pick up IP address. 
And if let's say, for example, you want to have multiple IP address for high mobility purpose, you will actually pull multiple address from the pool itself. Okay. Um, yeah, so transport zone, um, there's two types of transport zone, as I mentioned. One is overlay. The overlay is used for all your holes and your edge transport nodes. Okay. It basically carries the journey and encapsulate traffic. So you have the traffic, your, your, for example, your tier one gateway, your segments, your load, your web, uh, your virtual machines going to the segments. These form the overlay transport zone. Okay. But you still need a VLAN transport zone because, as I mentioned, the, the physical network talks VLAN. Okay. So if you want to connect your virtual world to your physical world, you actually need to have this tier zero gateway. Basically, it's the, it's the point, it's the gateway that, that, uh, you know, com kind of convert between VLAN to overlay, right? It's the router that route between the overlay network and the VLAN network. So you actually need to use a VLAN transport zone for it. So you actually connect the VLAN transport zone and it connects to the physical. So again, it can carry the 802.1Q tech traffic, okay? the VLAN traffic. More information about the transport zone. Okay, as I said, the transport zone can have multiple different types of transport nodes. Okay, and uh, but it doesn't mean that there's a secure boundary. So you can you cannot say I create a transport zone and, and use it as a secure boundary. It's not a security mechanism. Okay, it's not meant for that. Uh, and a hypervisor node can belongs to multiple transport zone. And um, yeah, the edge can connect to multiple transport zone as well, right? Overlay and as well VLAN. So don't worry about that. During the the lab, you will you you will you will you will do this. And then you will understand what do I mean by here, right? Uh, why do you actually need to connect the edge to multiple zone? Because you need to route between the physical and virtual network and why the hypervisor just needs to connect to overlay, okay? Because you just need to switch between uh, or virtual machines, right? It doesn't need to, to cross a VLAN. Although you can still, you can still use a VLAN transport node for, for VLAN transport zone for a transport node as well, okay? So this is how you actually do it. Uh, you go system, transport zone, you add a zone, right? you can actually create a zone and then you can actually say which zone you want or either overlay or the VLAN transport zone, okay? And then once you are done with the transport zone, you will see all this up and running, okay? Then with that, you can actually configure NSX. So you have to choose the cluster, which cluster you want it to enable this uh software itself the nsx software so once you choose the, the cluster you do not need to install manually one by one right you can choose the cluster configure nsx then what nsx manager will do you will push down all the software to the cluster and you will start to have all these you know layer two to layer seven capabilities on your hypervisor itself right it's just like you know it's, it's, it's a bit like your phone right where you go to the app store or or whatever, and you download the app and you install the application on your phone, you have more capabilities on that. It's a very similar concept. Okay, so um, I'm going to create a transport zone, but like what I say, um, a lot of things are being created already, okay? I I need to delete things, okay? Um, and I'm just thinking like, should I do it uh, when you all guys are back or should I do it... Um, when you're having a break, okay? Let me think. I'm not sure whether you all like, like to see. I, I think it's better that you all take a look because you all will be doing the same thing as well, okay? Uh, okay, so let's go for a 10 minute, uh, 10 minutes break, okay? Let's go for a 10 minutes break. Uh, freshen up yourself, grab a drink, you know, come back. Yes. Vincent, there are five questions, but I think I will not ask the question, all of the questions first. I'll just um, start with the very basic question from the it's part. There are there is one very basic question. Yeah. I think it is important. Um uh, I know that the students here has already experience in creating a virtual machine in GCP, GCP Google mm. platform. Basically, they just create another computer for themselves, but in cloud. So I think yeah. this is, uh, when you talk about virtual switch, is it you actually create another virtual machine that has the capability of switching, or you actually create 
um, the virtual switch itself. I mean, you like switch and then you create virtual version of it. Yeah, we, it's, it's not a virtual machine. Um, we, we don't create another virtual machine. Um, I mean, the, the virtual machine that you create in GCP is just a workload, right? So in GCP itself, when you actually create the uh, a, a network, right? We create a network in the virtual in in GCP. This is something similar like what we are doing right here in NSXT when we create a virtual switch. Okay, so the virtual switch is being created in the hypervisor itself. So hypervisor, you okay in GCP you don't see this, and right? because it's done in the back end for you, but in your private cloud in your data center, someone actually needs to set up this infrastructure before someone can actually create the network like what i did just now like a virtual switch okay so you, you you didn't see that process because i have put it right now right i'm going to show you what you actually needs to do before you can actually create a virtual switch this is what we create called a transport zone and installing software into the hypervisor before someone can create a virtual switch Okay, in GCP, it is the engineer in Google that actually do this for you, right? So in your private data center, that's where you know, you know, our, what we call the NSX engineer actually has to do this. Okay, hopefully that addressed the question. And and and, and exactly, I'm going to show you right now, right? Because uh, I have show you the the user level, but I didn't show you what's underneath, like uh, under the hood, right? Okay, thanks. I think that uh, I think Pauzan will ask that question as well, right? So you're still confused between virtual machine and virtual switch. So that's the answer. You don't see the virtual switch in GCP because yeah, you only see the virtual machine. The rest, the networking part, the security part, is all done transparent to you. But in um, NSX VMware, you will see by yourself, and you have to set up by yourself because Correct. that's what the networking part is. Yeah. Correct. Yes. Yeah. Thank exactly. you, Vincent. You can continue because the, the other question is related to the feature of NFX. Like, I will keep it later after you explain the transport zone and so on. Yeah, you can. You can. I mean, I saw the question. Like, basically, you you can create all the networks. And uh, the the question regarding the DHCP pool, whether can you create a binding, is the same, right? We can. Is is the DHCP that you you are familiar with? Um, you know, you you can create MAC address binding. If you want a certain IP address for your for your machine, right? For your virtual machine, you can actually put in the MAC address of your virtual machine and you will always assign the same IP address, right? Uh, VMware focus on virtual network. No, VMware focus on everything. Virtual machine, the network underneath, the storage, right? We don't just focus on a, a particular topic, right? So we are very similar like uh, GCP, any, any other public cloud vendors, but we focus in the private cloud, okay? Um, you know, not, not a lot of companies actually focus on the data center. How do you actually make your data center into a cloud? So that's what VMware is trying to do, right? And uh, a, lot of a lot of hyperscalers actually trying to do what VMware is trying to do, right? So you um, one of the popular ones is like AWS Outpost, right? So you are familiar with, uh, you know all the AWS like uh, like GCP, but what yeah, if I want like what what if I want a cloud infrastructure, but not in a cloud, but in my own data center? Can I still use the same management stack like what I have in AWS or GCP? But the 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 actual server I want to see it in front of me, right? So so a lot of hyperscaler actually have that kind of offering right now. Uh, for us, it's, it's natural, right? Because VMware actually started off in the data center itself. So for us, it's a natural progression where we don't just look at virtual machine, we, we look at the virtual switches and the virtual networks as well. Okay, so... Um, yeah, I think that's answer to the first question. Is it possible to bridge NSX to on-premise networks? So basically you are doing this, right? You're offering this service. Correct, yes. Yes, that's what we're trying to do, right? Uh, within the NSR, do we need to configure routing between the tier tier one gateway? 
No, um, we, I will cover this later. Okay, uh, we don't need to configure any routing in the tier one, but tier zero onwards, yes, you need to configure that. Okay, I think um, you probably are very advanced already because I haven't covered that and you are asking this question. So, uh, yeah, then I have, I have addressed the DSCP questions. Uh, I'm still confused. This is the one I think uh, Human asked. Yes. Yeah. Thanks. So, is it possible to create a default configuration like IP pool, IP pool for all devices that we can simulate on on-premise network? There. Yeah. I. I. I mean, I'm. I'm not sure exactly what you are asking, but are you saying that you have a physical network and you're trying to replicate this in a virtual world? Yes, you can do that. Okay. Like you want to create a sandbox environment? Yeah. Uh. I think the, the last one is actually the same question, right? Yeah. Okay. Right. Yeah, thank you, Ravikid. Yeah, thank you. No problem. Uh, yes, we should continue. Sure, sure. Okay, um, I'm going to continue with the lab and um, hopefully my screen is big enough so that I can actually do this side by side. I'm not sure. It's really small. Okay, so this is the lab guy. Um, and I'm not, I'm not going to go through everything, but there is some steps over here that is very important so uh, so that I can actually show you how to actually install uh, NSX and you know show you like what you actually needs to do before um, uh, before you can actually create virtual switches okay so I sorry it's a bit small and hopefully you will still be able to see. So what we're gonna do is, uh, okay, we need to go and remove all the virtual machine network first. Okay. I'm going to edit this. Okay, this is this is what this. Let me change the app. Okay, so you will do all these steps because the lab, the lab was already set up with. Uh, a working one. So what you actually need to do is to go and uh, remove all the configuration so that you can actually do it yourself. Okay. Uh, okay. So basically, I'm trying to uh, remove all these things, uh, change the logical switch so that you know, you saw just now when I was trying to remove, uh, you know, logical switch. It was says that there is some, there is still some um, workloads connected to it. Okay, so now I have removed everything. So, so basically, I'm on this step right now. So let me see whether I can reduce the size a bit more. Let me see. Okay, so I'm actually doing all the steps right here, removing all the segment. Okay, so now I need to go and remove the segments. So these are segments. I will remove the segments. Okay. So I need to delete the tier zero gateway. You know, I cannot remove NSX. Okay. okay. And I need to go back to the segments, delete the uplink interface. Okay, so now it's all empty now. Tier zero, tier one, it's all good, good nothing. Then we need to go and, uh, as this, go to the host system notes. Okay, I need to remove NSX. Okay, so what he's trying to do is to try to remove this. Okay, so it will take about three minutes. So once it's done, this is so. This is this is what I meant, right? This is actually you need actually needs to configure this NSX over here, okay? So this is how we actually enable the hypervisor 
the place where you know this one right this this is the exxi so when you when you create virtual machine so for example this is well, i can also create new virtual machine this is what i talk about right or you talk about this is like what you do in gcp how you create a virtual machine but when you create a virtual machine it needs to select the network so how this network comes about like this web machine right previously i connected to web logical switch which is basically a segment that I created in the networking here. You, you need to define the transport zones, right? So this is where, you know, where, where you mentioned like, okay, where is the span of my transport zone, which overlay it connects to. Okay, this is like, you know, if you're familiar with like VTP, right? VLAN transport uh, protocol where you say is that, okay, how, where's your switches? These are the few switches that I have. And when I configure a VLAN, these are the few, places the few switches that I will have to configure okay so this is this is very similar to, to that okay where you define your transport zones and then um, uh, you can actually enable your host so once you enable your host when you configure the NSX then you can go and create segments itself okay so what what I, what I'm going to do is you know this is defining the network that you connect to your virtual machine so right now, um, there's a lot of things that you actually need to do, like delete the transport zones, right? Delete the H nodes and all this compute manager. I'm, I'm not going to do all this, not to clean up the lab. I'm just going to leave it as it is like this. Okay. So what you actually need to do now is to go system. Okay. So the, the, way, the way that it works is um, if you go to the inventory, right? I don't think you can see any virtual machines. Okay, so this is this is how it works. If you don't install the software onto the EXXI host itself, you are not able to see the virtual machines. Right, that is like you are not you are not installing any software. There's no software to discover the virtual machine and put in any network functionality over there. So what you actually need to do is to go to these nodes. Okay, after you have configured your profiles, right, all these transport zone, you declare your transport zone, your overlay transport zone, your VLAN transport zone. Okay then you can go and enable your host okay so i have multiple clusters over here so my h clusters so i'm not going to enable this i'm going to install the uh the nsx software into this host itself then i need to select the transport node profile where this one will comprise of the uplinks how you how the uplinks will look like what is the algorithm that you want to use for the load balancing and all this kind of thing okay so when i click apply this will start installing the software. You can see that, you can see the progress over here. Okay, you start installing your software. Yeah, so while it's installing the software, of course, you know, I didn't show you like, um, you know, to actually bring this up, right? If, if you do, so this is what we're going to set up in our lab itself, like to set up the whole, whole the, the whole topology, where is this your desktop, you connect to a physical router, right? And then you can configure BGP over here, connect to your tier one router so that your three tier application, your web app DB can actually work with each other, okay? So this is what we're going to do. So the first thing you actually need to do is to deploy the NSX manager. Okay, so this is like, this is how you like deploy your virtual machine in GCP. So first thing you need to deploy the manager. Okay. So this step is not done in your lab. Okay. This is already done for you. The appliances are already in stock for you. Okay. So this is the NSX manager appliances where you are now assessing the UI of the appliances. So once you finish all this, you can run through the lab itself, connect to the NSX manager, connect to the compute manager. Okay create a transport zone. This is what you're going to do. Create an uplink profile. Okay. And create a tap pool. Okay. All this is being done. And then create a transport node profile. But all this, I, I didn't delete all this so that I actually just leave it, um, leverage it. Then you can actually enable the NSX over here. Okay. You can enable the NSX, which is what I just did. So when I go back here, so you can see that it's still, still in progress. It's 48% takes about 10 minutes. So once this is done, okay, you can go to the inventory, then you can actually see the virtual machine, then you will start populating. This is what how you actually enable you know, the host to have the NSX software 
then you can start going into here and start creating the segments. Okay, so like what humans say, and I kind of explained it earlier on, um, you know, you, you do not need to do all this, right? You do not need to install the software in GCP because in GCP, the uh, Google engineers has done this already in their, in their stack. They could, they could be using a different approach. They might be installing the software into a physical NIC that creates overlay. Okay, I don't know how Google did it, but that is how um, AWS actually do it. Their NIC, they actually install the software onto the NIC itself so that they can actually create this kind of overlay, you know, um, you know software-defined networking on, onto their stack. Okay, but for VMware, we this is what we actually do, right? Okay, so uh, in the interest of time, I will just let it continue. And then um, basically, this is what I, I wanted to show you all as well, is to basically, you know, uh, enabling the transport zone, okay? Uh, and enabling NSX. So let's continue with the last module, which is routing, okay? Hopefully, um, uh, I have the time to finish it. Um, just going to be a little bit quicker. So basically, routing is being used uh, in a multiple ways. You can actually create, uh, you know, so you have multi-tenants over here, like for example, a test network, you have a production network, you want to create gateways for it. You can do that so that you can actually route within each other. Uh, you could also use routing to separate, like for example, I want an environment, I want a gateway for containerized workloads. I want a gateway for multi-hypervisor environment. Okay, so you can also do that as well, make use of routing. Uh, so for routing to work, you need a few prerequisites. The management clusters needs to be formed. Okay, you need to create the transport zones. You need a hypervisor to prepare for the NSXT data center, just like what I just did. Right? You need to install the, the NSX bits into it. Uh, you must attach the transport nodes into a different transport zone, basically like uh, the, the appropriate transport zone. Like for example, if you want your transport node to do, do overlay network, then you need to put it into the overlay transport zone. You want your NSX H to be participating in the VLAN transport zone. Then you need to configure your transport zone, transport node to connect to the transport zone, the VLAN transport zone. Okay. So um, what are some of the features for the gateways? Okay, so this is like, you know, the gateways, these are basic gateways are just routers, okay? And then what it does is it allows your segments to route to each other. So this is one segment, this is one network, this is another network, and you need the router to route between them. Then of course, you can you can route to your physical network as well. This is a north-south routing, right? So gateway provides north-south routing as east-west routing. It has multiple instances of that running on the edge nodes. So it's like uh, high avail highly available. And then like services like gateway firewall, net address translation, load balancer, VPN services, these are all run in the gateway as well. So there is two different type of gateway. One is called a tier zero gateway. The other one is a tier one gateway. So, um, you know, I, I need to explain this a little bit. So the, the use case that I talk about, like the automation use case, as I mentioned, you know, we enable the, the enterprise IT department to become like the service provider. So there is like, you know, there is like in the in the typical enterprise IT environment, they also support different line of business, uh, you know, end users group. So they become like a service provider. So they manage a set of infrastructure. Then the different line of business can come and consume this private cloud and they can create their own routers as well. Okay. So therefore the tier zero is like the owned by the service provider. The tier one gateway is like a tenant, the tenant in the cloud itself. Okay, they can come in and manage their tier one gateway. So tier zero, as as because this the this is the gateway or the interface between the virtual world and the physical world. Therefore, you need to support the like say for example, you are using a routing protocol like BGP or OSPF. Uh, of course, the tier zero gateway needs to support that as well. Uh, it needs to support high performance requirement, right? Uh, it could be a lot of north-south going through. 
in your environment. That's that's where we have like equal cost multipathing. You can use active active gateways to scale out. Then you can actually uh, fulfill the huge uh, bandwidth or performance required. Okay, we forward the traffic between north south. It requires an NSXH cluster. So these are like actual virtual machine, but instead of a normal workload virtual machine, this is like a router and it's actually deployed by NSXT and we call it the H, H cluster. This will actually perform the, the routing itself. Then we have the tier one gateway. As I said, this is a by, managed by the tenant. It doesn't need to require, does not use any dynamic routing protocol. I think this was one of the questions being asked previous on. I think you are really familiar, you, you have some familiarity with NSXT, right? So basically tier one gateway doesn't need to use dynamic routing protocol. All this routing in tier one gateway is being done automatically by NSXT. So I, I know in your physical world, like if you have two routers and you want to connect together, you actually need to create a transit segment, like a slash 30, and then you have to connect the two routers. In here, all this is being done automatically for you. You do not need to do that. Right, so that saves you a lot of time. So, of course, you know, you could have multiple, multiple instances of tier one gateway, right? And, and what we're trying to, what NSXT is trying to do here is to help you to simplify all this configuration. Um, yeah, basically, it does all the east west routing. So, if you want to route out, basically, if you just want to enable east west, you, you can just leave with a tier one gateway. But if you need to route out to a physical world, then your tier one gateway needs to connect to the tier zero gateway. Okay. Uh, require H cluster. Yes. Um, yeah. If you if you want to run services like uh, load balancer services, net, and all this, then you need to configure an NSX H cluster. Okay. So there's different topology that you can configure. So this is the single tier topology where you have tier zero, you just connect your segments to the tier zero gateway. Now, this is a multiple tier, uh, you know, like a service provider with different tenants, you have a different tier one. So this is how it looks like. You can connect different tier one gateways to a single tier zero, okay? Then, okay, this is about H nodes. So H nodes provide connectivity to the external network. It requires to host the tier zero gateway. So I'm not sure whether you are familiar with uh, VRF, virtual routing, uh, virtual router forwarding. So basically it's like a physical router. You can actually break the router up into different smaller routers. It's very, it's very similar concept over here. Uh, just that, you know, the, the, the router here or the gateway over here is like a logical construct. And then your H nodes are the, the actual component that is actually routing the thing. And it, this router, it appears the gateway itself, it appears in multiple H nodes, right? This is for high validity purposes and uh, scalability purposes. You need the H nodes to do this function, this routing function, and um, it, you need to have multiple H in these H clusters. So these are like multiple VMs that you see in H clusters. Okay, so what do we mean by that? So if you go into um here notes uh h cluster okay so this is what we meant by h cluster in this h cluster itself there's multiple nodes there's two nodes okay and um, the nodes itself these are the nodes okay there's four nodes over here and if you go into the cluster these are the four nodes that you you see over here okay the the actual h nodes itself so you can pick one two Form a cluster, or you can even have four to form a cluster, and that will provide like high ability and scalability. Okay, this is what we mean by here. Um, just like your physical network, you have multiple uplinks that you connected to. Okay, um, uh, you can also do that with your virtual gateway, your virtual router. Uh, this this is using one VLAN. You can have one uplink per H one H node. You can also have multiple uplinks per H node to so these two uplinks per H node, and you are using multiple uh, VLANs to do that. Okay, so that you can have high availability. So if one of the H node fail, you still have another path to go to the physical router. Okay. Okay, so things are, this is going to be a little bit complicated over here. Okay, but I'll try my best, and hopefully you can get to understand. 
I will share the slides. If you don't understand this, uh, it's okay. You just need to read it a few times. Um, you know, even a lot of experienced engineers, um, you know, that that just started with NSXT, this this could be a, a a more complicated topic. Okay. So basically, when we say distributed router, these are like instances of router where we actually distribute into the hypervisor farm, right? So each hypervisor or each transport node actually have this distributed router. So that helps in providing routing for workloads running in that hypervisor itself. Okay, so it doesn't need to go out to the physical router to do routing. It can actually route within the physical ESXi or the server. So it span the transport nodes. Okay, um, it runs in the kernel module in the ESXi. Okay, provide the distributed routing. Provide the first hop routing. So like the gateway, remember when I created a segment, I actually put in the gateway of the workloads. Right, that actually, that is actually the the SVI, right? The SVI is actually being configured in the distributed router. A service router is basically provide all the north south routing, like for example, like tier zero, right? It provides the tier north south routing. Um, we also provides the centralized services such as net load balancer, okay, required for uplinks to configure to the external network. As they plot in the edge transport node only. So this is very important. Like when you talk about services, services can only exist in the in the edge nodes itself, which is the VM, right? The VM, if you want like net services, it has to be in the in the VM itself. It cannot be in the hypervisor. Okay. So SR implement all the centralized services and required for uplink. If you configure uplink, then you need SR. DR is basically all the distributed routing. Okay. Uh, both tier zero can have the SR and DR function. And um, tier zero, tier one can also have the SR and DR function. So if you if you have a look at the physical landscape of the data center, right? And then these are like hypervisor itself, is the EXXI, which is the transport nodes. And then the green one is actually the VM. Okay, this the green one is the VM, the the the, the one that I just showed you just now, which is over here, right? The V, the green one are all these H nodes. Okay, the blue one, uh, the black one, this black one are the hypervisor itself. This is the hypervisor. So the distributed router will be installed in the hypervisor, and then, okay, so you will do all the routing for your workloads, your VMs. These are your VMs. You will do all the routing. And then if your VMs needs to route up to the physical network, that's where it actually requires this green color object, which is the H node. And the H node inside here has the SR where it connects to the uplink and it actually route out to the physical network. Okay. So again, this, this few, next few slides will show you when you configure in a logical construct, how does NSXT configure the H node VMs and all this? Okay, so for example, this is a single topology, a tier zero. We just two segments. These two segments are connected to the tier zero. Okay, so what it needs, it needs to have a DR. Okay, and then it has the uplink and it has the SR. So what happened is the DR will exist, the distributed router will exist in the H node one, H node two. Okay. And then you appear in the hypervisor for routing. And then for the SR that it actually connects to the uplinks, this will only appear in the H node one and two. Okay. So slightly a little bit more complicated. Now you have a multiple tier topology. Okay, so now you have a segment, you have one tier one, and another tier one here, another segment. And these two tier one connects to a tier zero. So in this case, now you have more than one DR, right? Because you have the DR for a tier zero, you also have the DR for tier one, okay? So all these DR will exist in the H node one, H node two, EXXI one, EXXI two, okay? Then if they need to route out to the physical network, the SR one and SR two are actually living in the H node, okay? Then what happened now, if you start to have net services or load balancer services enabled, then your tier ones need to have the SR function, right? So this is SR. So now your DR will not connect to the tier zero DR directly. You will have to go through this services router, okay? So 
the DR tier zero tier uh, tier one, sorry, the DR tier one will exist in all the different nodes, H node and the uh, ESSI. However, the SR, the orange color one, will only appear in H node. Okay, so this is very important. Services can only happen in the H node, which are the VMs. Okay, the distributed router can only, the ESSI can only do the distributed routing function, which is just pure routing only. Okay, so this is all you have line up and you know, you will see multiple interface types, uh, what we call. So we have the physical router, we have the SR, this is basically this is the tier zero, and this is the tier one. Then we have what we call the uplink interface, we really kind of uh, introduced to you. Then for SR and DR, we have this intra tier transit link. Okay, so the SR and DR intra tier transit link. Then between the tier zero and the tier one, we have what we call the router link port. Okay, this is what we call that. And then if you connect your tier, your D, your your uh, DR to a workload, what we call a downlink. This is where the downlink. This is where you have to hook up your workloads. This is where we call the downlink. Okay. And then we have a last one, we have a special interface called a service interface. This is where you want to hook up a VLAN, VLAN based services to the router. And this is what we call a uh, service interface. Okay, now uh, with all this, let's do a packet walkthrough. So what this, this is a story between like a VM. Okay, this is a 10.1.1.10. Okay, this workload. And what it needs to do is communicate out to the physical network itself. And this physical machine, maybe this is a laptop, and the laptop is uh, having this address 192.168.10.1. Okay. So, uh, so the packet is sourced from this address, okay, and it's forwarded to the gateway. Of course, it's an unknown address, so it's forwarded to the packet. So now when you reach the tier zero router, it also has a routing table. So of course it doesn't know this network, right? It doesn't know 192.168.10 because the destination is this. So you look at the table, doesn't know. Okay, so you use the default route. And the default route, what is the gateway is actually the tier zero SR router, right? 169.254.0.2. So what you do, you will use this interface and send this over to the other side. But in order for to do that, because this is an overlay transport zone, what it needs to do is to add in a Geneve header. Okay, so you add in a Geneve header. Then the Geneve header will have its own source IP and destination IP. And what are all these IP? These are the tunnel endpoints. This is the tunnel endpoint. So it, it, the Geneve the packet, when you look at it in the physical network, it actually uses this source sending to this destination. So once it's sent over to this H node, because it's going up to the physical network, right? So you need to send out to the H node. So once you reach the H node, what you do, you will decapsulate the Geneve packet. Then you will look inside the Geneve packet and say, that, oh, okay, this is the payload coming in and I'm going to 192.168.10.1. Look again, look at the routing table. Yes, it has this network and it is going up via the uplink, SR uplink, which is on the 172.16.251.98, which is here, this one, which is a physical router right now. So this H node will take this payload, route it out to the physical network. Okay. Then of course, the physical network will then reach to the uh, destination, this one. Maybe it's a workstation. Then, how about the reply? So now it needs to reply back to this. Maybe it's a pink, so it needs to reply. So you will send the source is now this IP address 192.168.10.1. Is the destination is of course going to the virtual machine. Okay. Then again, you send it to the H node. Now the H node needs to look up to the routing table. Okay. Again. So now it actually make use of the tier zero DR, right? Because uh, the packet is already routed into here and says that, okay, I need to reach this network 10110 is actually going down to the down link. Okay. So again, because it needs to go over the overlay transport zone, what it does, it will encapsulate again using 
the journey workload right, using the tab IP address 215154, send it over to the other side. Okay, then the DR hypervisor will actually take out the journey header and pass the payload to the machine itself. Okay, so that's how it actually communicate. Okay, so I don't know whether I have the time to actually do this. Um, I, this hopefully, let me see. Is there, is there any questions so far? Anything? There is some question related to your presentation before. It's like, um, uh, can you can you give us simple little use case where we need to set up for our own SDN instead of letting our SGGP to do it for you? So I think that edge um, nodes, setting up transport nodes, is the thing that is transparent for the user in AWS and GCP, right? But in here, we have to create those um, edge nodes and also transport zones so it can connect to, to the yeah, outside. Yeah, it's more like a private private cloud use case. So, mm -hmm. so like in, in GCP, right, or AWS, you know, what that's what we call public cloud. And a lot of time, what, what they want to do is like, for example, like developers, they go to the public cloud, they can swap their credit card, they can get services. But in your data center itself, it's not so straightforward, right? You, you, you If you want to enable this kind of self-service consumption, you actually need APIs, right? And, um, and then one of the use cases of SDN is to, is to do that, right? Is you, you want, if you want to create a private cloud, you, actually, you have to use an SDN. If not, there's no way for the developers to consume um, the network itself. Right, to, to, to go into the portal, to create a workload, to create you know, the networks themselves, and they can actually do self-service themselves. So that's the use case. Uh, we, we call it the self-service IT. Um, this, is, this is what most of the customers actually use NSXT for. Okay. And what about the, the other question about layer application? Did um, firmware also provide, you know, um, instead of this bypassing this kind of network, uh, layer two, layer three, and layer four, and directly go to layer five, the application one. So deploy things, you know, like cloud run in GCP or whatever in AWS. Yeah, so for us, it's more like um, the, the, I mean, in in terms of application, it will be like Kanzu with the containerized, the modern apps, right? Then there's a Horizon, which is a VDI mm -hmm. Horizon desktops. I right? can also make use of uh, uh, software defined networkings. Um, you know, yeah, the other one is a cloud management platform. So these are like the application that actually uses um, the, the virtual machines and the, and the network, virtual, the virtual networks that you actually created. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, so um, do, do, do I have a hard stop at, uh, in four minutes time or is it okay to yeah. extend a little bit more? Um, I think you can extend maybe five, 10 minutes. We can have, yeah, I think that's still okay. Okay. Yeah, so hopefully I can I can do it really quickly. Okay, so I'm, it's actually the demo. I just want to create yeah, the PSU tier one for you. Uh, so let me go back to the lab guide again. Okay, so all these are done. So hopefully this is a simple one. So what we need to do is to create um, the logical router and, and the segments. Okay, so go back to here. Okay, so go back to NSXT itself. Now let's create the tier zero and tier one. So add the gateway, tier zero, tier zero, gateway. Save it. So now we can create a tier one gateway. Okay, now we can actually select. So this by doing this, you are connecting the two gateways together. And like what I say is right, this is really simple. There's no need for you to configure the transit segment, right? And um, NSXT will do it for you. Okay. So now we need to go and create the segment. Okay, now we have to create multiple segments. So that Logical switch and then connect to the gateway tier one gateway. 
then select the transport zone. Okay, and then we need to give them, give it the IP address on 17.16.10.1 slash 24. Okay. Save it. Okay, now I need to create two more segments, app logical switch. So again, it's connected to the tier one gateway. Transport zone is overlay transport zone. And then we need to give it the IP address. Okay. Save it. Okay, now we need to create a database segment. And then we want to switch. Connect to the tier one gateway again. Or age transport zone. And you can have IP address. Save it. Okay, so this is done. And then we need a VLAN segment now. Okay, we need to connect the tier zero um, to the uplink. So now we call it tier zero. Tier zero uplink. VLAN 120. Okay. Connected gateway is the tier zero. Okay, we are connected to the tier zero. Transport zone is the VLAN transport zone. Okay. So this one, there's no IP address. We need to put in the VLAN ID 120. Okay. And save. Okay, so now what is this? Uh oh no, no okay, yeah, no need to connect gateway. Sorry. And save it. Okay, now this is done. Okay. Okay, you can create an H cluster is already there. So now we just need to go back to the tier zero and associate it with the, the H cluster. Okay. Okay, so now we need to create the uplink. So you go and set the interfaces. Okay, you need to add the up interfaces. Now we call it uplink one. Okay, and then the IP address is four. And then this is the uplink that we connected to. Okay, now you need to select H node. Eight to one. Okay, then we save. Okay, then we create another interface. There's a second uplink. Then we two. Four. Connected to the uplink interface. Select the second H node, the second uplink. Okay, save it. A okay, two interface. Was up, you can close it. Now, okay, we have to configure the BGP. So again, our BGP, our local AS number is 65012. Configure that. Okay. And then now we need to set the BGP neighbor. So set the BGP neighbor. Add the BGP neighbor. So this is a this is the physical router, okay? Then we can enable it, enable the BFD so that the failover is faster. And then the, the AS number is this address, okay? Select the source IP address because there's multiple routers. That's what we can configure. Uh, then we just set the BFD timer. The BFD is 1000. The bio is three. Hold down timer is 180. And then keep alive is 60. Save it. Close. Save. Okay. Okay, so now what we need to do is to set the route distribution. So 
go back here. Redistribution, right? Just like your physical router, you need to set uh, your distribution. To, to edit it. Add route distribution. You see, you just say T0, T1. Okay. Let's set. Okay. Connected route and then connected interface. Apply. Add. Apply. Save. Okay. That's it. Then we need to go to the tier one and we need to edit it. We need to do the um, set the route advertisement. Again, we need to configure all connected routes. This one. Okay, save it. Okay, so I don't remember I actually have connected to my, let's see. I need to connect to the logical switch. So I'm doing really fast here, so I'm not sure whether I miss any steps. Okay, and the app to the app logical switch. So the, all these networks are the one that I created. Okay. And the DB. Okay, so basically these are the steps that I already connected. So if, if I do correctly, and if you go into your region A customer, yes, so this is this is all working, right? So basically you are querying, you go to the web 01A and then you can actually query all this. That means my BGP is working, my all my routing is actually working, okay? So this is all good. So you can actually do some testing if you want to. So like, for example, I can ping the web gateway, web 01. Remember the IP address one seven two dot sixteen dot ten dot eleven, and ping directly. Okay, and you can see that it actually go through um, multiple route. Let me expand it for you. Okay, you can actually right go through multiple routes. Okay, go to one two zero dot four. So one two one two zero dot four is actually my second, um, the, my H node two right. So see, see over here, I can go in here, it's active, active. So if I shut down my, if I power off my H node 2, okay, you'll see that some ping drop and hopefully it, uh, resume itself. Basically, it's uh, the, basically the BGP connection is being used, right? You previously was going through node 2, but I shut it down. So it's highly available. So now it goes to uh, uplink 1. So that's all I have um, on the last module. Um, I, I hope that, you know, it, it gives you a little bit of like the, the, some overview on networking and security on NSXT, just on the switching and routing. Of course, we have much more capability, but I don't have the time to, to share with you all the, the goodness of it. Uh, but, you know, nevertheless, I have put in some additional information in the slides. Uh, if you need, uh, if you want to know more information, you can go in. To look at the installation guide, uh, the upgrade guide, uh, admin guide, okay? And there's a lot of, uh, you know, this is just the beginning, right? If you want to really learn more about NSXT, there's the communities, uh, documentation uh, you, can, you can you can access to. And of course, the hands-on lab, you'll get to do it during your uh, lab session. We have a lot much more labs. 
and if you really want like you know this is like two hour session right uh but you know it's only a snippet but we have our official vmware learning as well you can also go and uh have the classes five day classes and all this you can you can on demand you can watch online or you can go to a physical class as well um, so this is this is a sample. Um, a lot of a lot of my material actually come from this NSXT data center install configure manage uh, materials. So if you want an official course, you can go in. Right, this this is the the uh, there's a lot of uh, things that they teach over there, much more than what I have. And then if you want to have some badges, you want to have some certification, right? Go for exam and achieve all these certification. You can do that. Um, I did I did share. I have. Um, I will I I would basically challenge myself to go for the highest level certification, uh, which is the VCBX. So yeah, if you want to learn more, you, um, you you want to challenge yourself, uh, you want to have some badges, you know, before you go to the working well, your working world and recognized by the industry. Yeah, you can go for some some of this certification, right? So these are the badges that you have. So with that, um, yeah, thank you so much again for your time. Uh, I really enjoy uh, speaking to you all. Uh, sorry for uh, taking another 10, min 10 more minutes of your time. Um, uh, Vincent, can you go to the question? There is two general questions. Maybe you can answer it quickly, but another yeah. one technical question, maybe you can keep it later on. But I think the last two do have real example. And also the last one, can I proceed firmware as a private cloud provider? I think those two can be answered in yeah so we, we definitely we we are we are very strong in the private cloud space right kind of like the number one if you think about private cloud uh we but th then again we do have public cloud services as well but we don't own a public cloud the way we do public cloud it's uh we can run you can run this nsx in in a public cloud that means the public cloud give you bare metal servers and we can install our stack on it Right, so one of the offering is called VMware Cloud on AWS. Uh, we also have uh, Azure Virtual uh, Services (AVS). We have Google called the GCVE. So this is where like partners, our partners, they actually take our software-defined data center stack, which is vSphere, vSAN, NSX, and install on bare metal uh, cloud provider. Then we can create a private cloud offering, but it's hosted in the public cloud. Uh, then, of course, now we have what we call the cross-cloud services, basically, like, for example, like management of uh, your workloads across multiple cloud, right? Now we are on this multi-cloud journey where you say that you have, if the customer has AWS, they have GCP, they have Azure, how do you actually manage all these different cloud? So VMA is also in that space. In that case, you know, you, you don't even need to have any hypervisor. So you can actually consume the VMA services as SaaS services and manage all these different cloud, right? So this is what we call the multi-cloud services. So we does both, right? So we are both in the private space. We are also in the public space as well. So hopefully that addressed the question. And then uh, second question is on the, the high availability and uh, fault tolerance. So, so, okay, VM high availability is a way in the hypervisor, how we provide high availability, basically is to prevent for host failure. Okay, so you have you have two hosts. We have uh, VMs running in one host. If these hosts fail, vSphere HA will reboot the virtual machine in another host. Okay, so that is what we meant by vSphere HA. Fault tolerance is different. Fault tolerance is you have two hosts. The two virtual machines are actually mirroring each other. Okay, so it's live, active, active, right? And then if this copy goes down, if this virtual machine goes down, the other virtual machine will straight away take over. So if you ask me which one is better in terms of high ability, fault tolerance is much better because you know you do not need to wait for the virtual machine to reboot. It will just immediately take over itself. However, fault tolerance actually takes much more CPU cycles because it needs to do the mirroring and mirroring of all the network packets and all this. Okay, so hopefully that address the question. Um, all right. Yeah, thank you so much, Vincent, for yep. these two hours. Very beneficial for us. And I think for the last session, I think if you guys can open your webcam, we, we, we might have some, take a picture together. Maybe Vincent sorry, also no, will. After that one incident, I decided, I pretty much feel, what is it? Um, too shy oh, yeah. to open my camera, sorry. Yeah, it's all right. 
if you can't open your camera, it's okay. But if you guys can um, open, it will be very good for. Yeah. Anyone? Rafi yeah. or one can help to take a picture. And maybe Vincent, you can stop your sex screen so we can have gallery. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Stop. <laughs> okay, I'm just, yeah. Okay. Uh -huh. Yeah. Okay. So, anyone who, who able to open your webcam, please do <clears throat> so in. Okay. Uh, yeah, Yoga will take the photos. I think they are um, about two pages yeah, worth of uh participants who enable their camera uh, anyone else who wants to join yes uh, can it say in short so you guys look very handsome and beautiful so don't worry about your hair but anyway yes, th thanks so much and, and if you have any comments or feedback please write to me right so uh really uh, want to hear from you, from your, yeah.